Anyway, you may be wondering, uh, what's an English professor doing at a nice conference like this? Uh, if you know anything about English professors, they're almost all Marxist. Uh, uh, I, I assure you I'm an exception. Uh, I'm one of a handful of free market uh, uh, English professors in the world. I actually studied with Ludwig von Mises when I was an infant. Uh, uh, I was 50 at the time. He was 80. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I actually considered becoming an economist. Obviously, I made the wrong choice. Uh, but I'm trying to make up for it, and I have for the past uh, decade or so been trying to show how uh, English literature uh, can teach us uh, uh, important pro-free market uh, lessons, and as I'll try to show this afternoon, uh, it actually can teach us something about taxation. And in fact, I'm going to discuss mainly this afternoon a very important episode in the history of taxation and of tax revolt, uh, but one which bears very much on literary history in the 19th century. Uh, but it is true that uh, if you start looking for it, you find uh, issues of taxation uh, coming up uh, all over literature. One of my areas is the Renaissance, uh, and uh, there was uh, tax revolt uh, being chronicled even in the Renaissance. For example, Francis Bacon uh, wrote uh, something called The History of the Reign of King Henry VII. Uh, and it's the first history I've seen that systematically deals with the issue of tax and tax revolt. One of the things that Bacon keeps showing in this history is how many problems uh, Henry VII got into because of taxes. Uh, uh, just to give you two examples. Uh, here's uh, one in the account. But uh, howsoever the laws made in that parliament did, did bear good and wholesome fruit, yet the subsidy granted at the same time bore a fruit that proved harsh and bitter. Parliament, uh, of course, uh, uh, raising taxes in order to subsidize the king. Uh, for when the commissioners entered into the taxation of the subsidy in Yorkshire and the British Brick of Durham, the people upon a sudden grew into great mutiny and said openly that if they had endured of late years a thousand miseries, and neither could nor would pay the subsidy. The local lord, the Earl of Northumberland, goes back to Henry, tells him there's trouble brewing in the province. Uh, the king wrote back peremptorily that he would not have one penny abated of that which had been granted him by Parliament, both because it might encourage other country, uh, counties to pay the like release or mitigation, and chiefly because he would never endure that the base multitude should frustrate the authority of the Parliament wherein their votes and consents were concluded. There you would, as you see, a taxation even with representation is tyranny. Uh, uh, upon this dispatch from court, the, the Earl assembled the principal justices and freeholders of the country, and speaking to them in the imperious language uh, wherein the king had written to them, uh, did not only irritate the people, but make them conceive by the stoutness and haughtiness of delivery uh, that himself was the author uh, of that council, whereupon the meaner sword routed together and suddenly assailing the earl in his house, slew him and divers of his servants. Uh, now, we're not recommending that kind of tax revolt, but there it is, uh, uh, all the way back in Francis Bacon's History of Henry VII. Again, just a little later in his reign. Uh, but it was fatal to the king to fight for his money. And though he avoided to fight with enemies abroad, yet he was still enforced to fight for it with rebels at home. For no sooner began the taxes to be levied in Cornwall, but the people there grew to grudge and murmured. They muttered extremely that it was a thing not to be suffered, that for a little stir in Scotland, soon blown over, they should be thus grinded to powder with payments. Notice. Uh, the king is using his wars in a foreign land to justify the increase in tax taxation at home. And said it was for them to pay that had too much and lived idly, but they would eat their bread that they got with the sweat of their brows, and no man should take it from them. I think I just found the source of Thomas Lorenzo, De Lorenzo's favorite quote from Thomas Jefferson there. That here Bacon is talking about the people complaining uh, that, that they would eat their bread that they got with the sweat of their labor uh, and no man should take it from them. Uh, and again, this tax revolt gets out of hand uh, and there's a mutiny uh, in this region of England. So Bacon already is talking about tax revolts. Uh, and my favorite author, Shakespeare. You find the same thing uh, there. Uh, uh, he, too, is very aware of how the English kings 
get into trouble because of overtaxing their subjects. Uh, one example is in his play Richard II, uh, where Richard himself says, uh, uh, again, he's got a foreign war going and he's wondering how he's going to pay for it. Uh, we will ourselves in person to this war and for our coffers with too great a court and liberal largesse are grown somewhat light, we enforce to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, whereto, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold. There it is again. Uh, tax them where the money is. Uh, and send them after to supply our wants, for we will make for Ireland presently. Uh, and then later in the play, the king's own counselors are telling him his taxes have got out of hands. Uh, the commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels and quite lost their hearts. Uh, and above all, he hath not money for these Irish wars, his burdensome taxation notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. And he basically, Shakespeare traces all of Richard II's problems to spending too much money on his court and therefore having to raise taxes so much that the people no longer support him and go over to his opponent, uh, Henry Bolingbroke, who becomes Henry IV. Now, there are many, many examples of this sort of thing in the history of literature. Uh, just show you that many of our great authors, including Shakespeare, are aware of the problem of taxation. Uh, but I want to concentrate uh, more specifically uh, on some material from the 19th century, uh, uh, a very important history in the episode uh, of English taxation, but one that's largely uh, uh, forgotten today. It will show us that uh, some of these problems that we think of as unique to the United States uh, actually are very much widespread and affect other countries uh, uh, as well. Uh, and so what I'm going to be talking about uh, mostly this afternoon, uh, and I will get around to the death of John Keats, I promise you, uh, uh, here. Uh, I was meant to provide a little comic relief uh, in the midst of this very serious discussion. And what could be funnier than the death of John Keats? Uh, uh, so we can, uh, but uh, I want to talk about something called knowledge taxes uh, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, these were taxes which affected uh, the course of all printed material and chiefly newspapers and books. Uh, and they became quite an issue in the course of the 19th century. Uh, and I bring this up because I also want to show that taxes are more insidious uh, than just something that takes our money our way away. Governments often use uh, taxation to carry out uh, their schemes, particularly against the liberties of their people, and this is an excellent example of, of it. So I'm going to be talking about three forms of taxes uh, in the 19th century in England. Uh, a tax on paper itself, uh, 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 the stamp tax, uh, which most people don't realize, among other things, required all newspapers to carry one of these government stamps. Uh, and therefore affected the, uh, very seriously the price of newspapers. Uh, and finally, and this is what's related to Keats' death, as we'll finally see, uh, a tax on advertisements, uh, 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 which prevailed through much of the 19th century. Now, uh, what we're dealing with here is one of the great achievements of free markets and capitalism in the 19th century, namely uh, the creation of widespread literacy, uh, making... Uh, books, newspapers, magazines, uh, other forms of print material available uh, to the population of England on a scale that was unprecedented in England and in the history of humanity. Uh, uh, there's an excellent book on it, which I'm largely going to be drawing upon by Richard Altick called The English Common Reader. Uh, this guy, as I'll show, is a fairly typical English professor and doesn't know what he's showing. Basically, the book shows that all the so-called public-spirited uh, efforts to create literacy, uh, various uh, charity groups, various government uh, enterprises, all of them failed. Uh, and the only thing that delivered the goods uh, that made it possible for the average Englishman and woman to have access to books, periodicals, and so on was uh, the free market. Again, uh, he would never admit that that's the story he tells, uh, but it is what he ends up doing here. Just to give you some statistics to give you a sense of what the free market uh, in print uh, accomplished in Britain in the 19th century. 
Uh, if you look at newspaper circulation, uh, at the end of the 18th century, so around 1800, uh, the London Times had a circulation, daily circulation of roughly 4,700 to 4,800 copies. That's it for the London Times, the biggest newspaper probably in the world at the time. 47 to 4,800 copies. By 1870, uh, its daily circulation had become 50,000 to 60,000 and had already been surpassed uh, by uh, the Daily News, the English version, uh, which had a circulation of 150,000. Uh, and by the end of the century, uh, in Britain, you were getting the first newspapers with a million daily circulation. Uh, similar figures for novels. So Walter Scott's Waverley is often considered uh, the first best-selling novel uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and it was a pretty amazing phenomenon in its uh, day. I think 1816 is when it was published. Uh, it sold 1,000 copies in the first five weeks. Uh, and 6,000 copies uh, in its first six months. And within a few years, it had sold 11,000 copies uh, here at the second decade of the 19th century. And that was considered uh, a huge success. That was considered the bestseller of its day. Uh, by 1889, uh, uh, Charles Kingsley's, Kingsley's novel, Westward Ho, nowhere near as famous as Scott's Waverly today, uh, in an 1889 reprint sold 500,000 copies. You know, now we're talking bestseller. And again, by the end of the 19th century in England, there were books selling in the millions of copies. So, so this, you know, makes it real for you what happened in the course of the 19th century. You went from uh, a position at the beginning of the century where selling thousands of copies of a newspaper or, or a book made you preeminent in the field. It's only around 1900 that the phenomenon of million selling comes into being. Uh, and there were lots of reasons for this happening, all sorts of technological improvements, the introduction of steam presses for printing, uh, the development of stereotype printing, and so on. There were all sorts of developments which the market came up with which made this possible. What was standing in its way? <laughs> Taxes. Uh, the principal drag uh, on the development of the British printing industry and hence of what we think of as modern mass literacy was in fact uh, the English tax system. Uh, uh, and that's why the opponents of these taxes labeled them taxes on knowledge or knowledge taxes. Uh, uh, it was the way they led their campaign uh, against these taxes. Now, as I said, there were three principal forms of taxes. Again, tax on bulk papered stamp taxes, you needed stamps uh, on a newspaper, and advertisement taxes. Uh, I'll discuss those in some detail. I do have want to begin with one subject that, that uh, Altic brings up uh, that helps kind of set the context for this uh, crazy tax situation uh, in, in 19th century Britain. One of the initial drags on literacy was something called the window tax in England. Uh, windows were taxed in such a fashion that people didn't have many of them, so they just didn't have enough light to read at the beginning of the 19th century. As Altic explains, in the ordinary home, decent lighting was not to be found until late in the 19th century. In the period 1808 to 1823, the window tax, a relic dating from 1696. Now, here's a little lesson in tax history, how taxes come into being. They're called temporary here, you know, lasting for over a century. Reached its highest level. Houses with six windows or less were taxed six shillings, six uh, pence to eight shillings annually. In a minute, I'll try to explain what those figures mean to us in real terms. Seven window houses a pound, nine window houses, two guineas, and so on up. Even an aperture only a foot square was considered a window. Although in 1823 the tax was halved, and in 1825 houses with less than eight windows were exempted, builders still were discouraged from putting any more openings in a house than were absolutely necessary, with the result that only one-seventh of all of the houses in Britain fell under the tax. Not without reason did Dickens remark that the window tax not abolished until 1851, was an even more fat, formidable obstacle to the people's reading than the so-called taxes on knowledge, the duties on newspapers, advertisement, and paper. Now, this, this is just a minor episode, but just think about it. You know, obviously, windows were regarded as a luxury at some point. 
you know, back in 1696. And so, oh, go ahead, tax the rich, tax windows. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the course of free market development, everybody starts to get windows. And they're very useful, especially before electric lighting. Uh, and here's the British government still taxing windows uh, in the 19th century. And, of course, the market responds. Uh, builders build houses with fewer windows. So the taxes will be less. And the result is a darkening of all of England. Uh, uh, and again, uh, someone as serious as Dickens thought that this was a genuine impediment uh, in the development uh, of, uh, of reading in England. No light. The enlightened government stamps out light by taxing windows. It's almost grotesque when you think about it, but uh, for almost two centuries there was a tax on windows uh, in, in England. Uh, now, to get to the, the, the main body of this material, uh, let me begin with the infamous Stamp Act. Now, we think of the Stamp Act as something that only affected Americans. But in fact, it prevailed in Britain itself uh, and was much resented uh, and had some terrible effects uh, there. It began in Britain in 1712. It was initially a, a penny tax. Uh, any uh, document needed this stamp on it, and that included uh, newspapers. Uh, uh, believe it or not, there were increases in this tax in 1776, 1789, these are all memorable years, uh, 1797, at which point it re reached three and a half pennies a stamp, uh, uh, and uh, uh, was raised again in 1815, right after Waterloo, uh, to four pennies. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't sound like too much to us. Uh, although, when you, I mean, I, I still remember the days of the three cent stamp in the United States. Uh, 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 when you realize how long ago this was that it was at three pennies, uh, it really was quite a bit. Uh, and the result was uh, the price of the average newspaper in England at the beginning of the 19th century was six cents, uh, six pence. Uh, uh, now again, because of inflation, it, it's hard, uh, we'd be happy to pay six, six cents for a paper today. But to put it in some perspective, and Alton's book is good on this and giving you some uh, 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 other prices in the economy, uh, a pound of candles, that's 24 candles, cost seven cents. Uh, and a pound of candles was enough to light a house for a week. So it cost you as much to buy your daily newspaper as it did to buy the candles you needed for a whole week. Uh, another way of putting this in perspective is uh, 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 the average clerk in an office, I should probably should say clerk in an office, made one pound a week. Uh, six cents is one-fortieth of a pound. Uh, so it meant one-fortieth of your salary for the week uh, had to go to buy your daily newspaper. Uh, uh, a very rough rule to convert 1,800 English pounds into contemporary U.S. dollars is 200 to 1. That would mean your daily paper costs $5 at this time. That's very rough, but gives you some sense of what this meant in terms of prices. Uh, so what that meant is basically newspapers were unaffordable to the average person in 1800. That's why the circulation of the Times was under 5,000. In fact, this was the heyday of uh, coffee houses where part of the attraction was they bought newspapers. And so you came there, drank a cup of coffee, uh, and read your newspaper because it was too expensive uh, to buy uh, yourself. Uh, so this was essentially a former tax that helped put uh, the average newspaper out of the reach uh, of the uh, average person uh, in England. Now, obviously, the government regarded this as a, as a revenue-raising device, but it also was a way for the government to control opinion in England. The, 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 uh, uh, the Crown and the parliamentary leadership did not like newspapers criticizing them, so they were very happy to help price newspapers uh, uh, out of the average person's uh, income. Now, uh, another one of the taxes was a tax on all advertisements, uh, and it was a three shillings, six pence tax on each ad placed uh, in a newspaper. We'll come back to that to see how it killed Keats. Uh, 
Uh, and then there was the tax on paper, which at the beginning uh, of the 19th century uh, was three pence per pound. Uh, it was again halved in 1837. There were constant oppositions to these taxes, but you can see how uh, the cost of a newspaper and also of books at this time very strongly reflected this tax system. Uh, and again, to give you a concrete example of it, uh, a man named Charles Knight, who was a pioneer in, in mass publication in the 19th century, came up with something called the Penny Cyclopedia. It's a marketing scheme that's existed to this day. Uh, he issued an encyclopedia uh, in uh, parts. Uh, it came out you know, monthly, and the big selling point was it cost only a penny per part, and eventually uh, you'd build it up and you'd have this whole complete encyclopedia. And it was actually very well done. Uh, uh, the, uh, the information of it, were, and it was high quality. Uh, he began in 1833. He ended up losing... 30,000 pounds, 30,788 pounds on this project. Again, that's a huge amount of money. Uh, it's, uh, uh, again, multiplied by 200 to get some sense of what it would be today. Of that, uh, of that loss, his paper duty alone on the publication project was 16,500 pounds. So more than, you can say, if he hadn't had that to pay uh, that paper duty, uh, his... Uh, losses would have been cut more than a half. Uh, and indeed, uh, several publications went out of business uh, in the 1830s, uh, uh, claiming uh, one of them, the quote is, uh, we were absolutely choked to death by the paper tax. Uh, so again, this, it, it, you know, it sounds small, uh, you know, three pence uh, per pound of paper, but you realize how many pounds of papers publishers use uh, it really was significant. Uh, uh, so uh, the combination of these taxes exerted an enormous drag uh, on the development of everything uh, we you know, prize when we talk about uh, print media today. Uh, the dissemination of newspapers, periodicals, publications of novels. Uh, uh, now, uh, it, uh, as I said, you would think, well, this was just a revenue-raising device. But in fact, it's a perfect example of how governments use taxes to target activities uh, uh, they don't like. Uh, <laughs> when Mark Thornton mentioned syntax, I said, oh, he's going to talk about grammar. Uh, another example of how English professors, you know, kind of miss the point on these economic <laughs> matters. But, but in fact, the amazing thing to realize is among the syntaxes at this time were, were these various taxes on paper, uh, and newspapers, uh, uh, the government regard and many and many authoritative people regarded reading as an evil uh, activity. It's so ironic because now you've got uh, the United States, the National Endowment uh, for the Arts, issuing this uh, dire report on the decline of reading uh, in America and the uh, federal government complaining people aren't reading enough. Governments in the early 19th century uh, maintained the principle that reading was bad for the people. Uh, it was a waste of their time. It took them away uh, from uh, 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 important work. Uh, and above all, it encouraged them to think uh, about what might be wrong with their governments. Uh, and so part of the, this tax campaign was an act of effort uh, to retard the growth of a mass reading public um, uh, in, in England. Uh, so uh, uh, to uh, give some specific examples of this that, that Altic uh, documents, uh, uh, in 1819, uh, the British government uh, 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 set up uh, some new uh, rules for taxation, specifically targeted. Uh, uh, this was an act under George III, December 1819. This law defined as a newspaper, and this, thus as subject to the tax, which had just been raised to uh, uh, four pence in 1815, every periodical containing news or comments on the news that was published oftener than every 26 days, printed on two sheets or less, and priced at less than six pence, exclusive of the tax. Now, Alter goes on to point out, the framing of the act left no doubt as to its purpose. 
It was legislation shrewdly designed to wipe out anti-government and anti-religious papers. It was not a tax upon news alone, as earlier newspaper stamp enactments had been, but upon views. And not upon all views, but specifically upon those of radical demagogues. Now let me say that in 1819, radical demagogues in England were people advocating the free market. Uh, they were arguing, for example, to return to the gold standard. They were arguing for relief from taxation. Uh, they were what we would call free marketeers, above all a man named William Cobbett. To avoid implying that all cheap newspapers were dangerous, uh, if that were so pertinently acquired a Newcastle pamphleteer, how are we to defend our cheap religious tract society pamphlets? The act went on to exempt from taxation papers containing only matters of devotion, piety, or charity. Now, this would be declared unconstitutional in the United States today, uh, but notice it's amazing, it's written into the act that if your newspaper was religious, it wasn't taxed, uh, that really left only these anti-government, pro-free market uh, papers. Uh, so again, it shows how insidious taxation can be. Here's a case where the government was using taxation uh, to adversely affect a specific segment of the press, and it worked. Because you notice, uh, if you, your price was under six pence, and therefore available to the masses, you were subject to the tax. The result uh, was that many of the radical papers went out of business, uh, whereas others, including the famous Black Dwarf and Cobbett's Political Register, went up to six pence, and their circulation fell off. Uh, so it actually had this chilling effect on the anti-government press in England, which was exactly its intention. Now, again, uh, businessmen uh, are resourceful. William Cobbett, who's one of the heroes of this time, uh, in my view, uh, came up with a great idea. Uh, he changed the name of his newspaper. Uh, uh, he, he called it Cobbett's Monthly Religious Tracts. Uh, 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 and then he changed his name to Cobbett's Monthly Sermons. You'd have to read the, it's a wonderful series of his tracts that's called Paper Against Gold, where he's inveighing against the new paper money system uh, in England. But, uh, you know, it just shows you what a hard time uh, uh, the government has uh, in, in trying to redefine these things. And indeed, uh, it's a perfect example of the Hayekian law of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, again, the, the target of the, the uh, uh, legislation was these specific radical newspapers. But again, in the kind of lobbying that goes on whenever a tax law comes around, uh, certain segments of the publication industry in England managed to get uh, serial publication of previously published books exempted uh, from this rule. Uh, so if you publish timely editorials uh, on current events, you were subject to the tax. If you were reprinting old fiction, you were not. The result was to give an enormous boost, a boost to so-called gothic fiction, to sleazy horror novels. Uh, so here's the British government ending up with this tax system, discouraging serious political discussion of current issues in print and encouraging the publication of the cheapest, sleaziest gothic horror stories uh, imaginable. Uh, uh, again, how tax policy can distort uh, uh, the world. And uh, uh, the other irony of it is people suddenly started uh, republishing Thomas Paine uh, and the other radicals from the 1790s because their works had been published in book form uh, and they now could, they wouldn't be taxed under the current law. Uh, so <laughs> the result was to leave uh, uh, the British government really no better off uh, than it was uh, before, a perfect example of how tax policy can backfire. In any case, uh, this pretty soon led to a series of tax revolts. Uh, uh, and excellent examples uh, of the whole phenomenon. Uh, in 1831 began what's known as the War of the Unstamped Press. Uh, and uh, a number of publishers in London decided they would simply uh, violate uh, the Stamp Act. Uh, uh, it began with a man named Henry Hetherington, who published something called The Poor Man's Guardian. And that, again, will give you an idea of what this popular press stood for. 
It presented itself as the guardian of the poor people in England against the predation of their government, particularly the excessive taxes. Uh, and he produced an unstamped weekly paper. He just issued his paper without the required government stamp on it. Uh, and this set off uh, uh, quite a tax revolt in the publishing industry. Uh, over the years, a uh, series of about three or four years, uh, 800 publishers were arrested, uh, of whom 500 were jailed or fined or both. Uh, Hetherington himself served three prison terms uh, in the, the course of this uh, tax revolt. Uh, notice, notice how familiar it sounds. I and mean, here he's doing this awful thing, trying to publish a cheap newspaper for people so they can find out what's going on in the world. For this he goes to jail three times. Uh, it's nice to report that one of the juries in one of his trials acquitted him in the grand old uh, British tradition of jury nullification. Uh, they, they just didn't like what the government was doing to the press. So although he was obviously and publicly guilty uh, of this, the, uh, uh, the jury decided what he was publishing wasn't a newspaper. And you can see what the Achilles heel of the government was here. They themselves had given a very odd definition of what constituted a newspaper so their opponents um, uh, could, uh, could uh, use that against him. Uh, this is an example of a tax revolt that uh, uh, succeeded. Uh, 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 in 1836, the stamp tax was reduced again to one penny. So that seems very significant. It comes down now from four pennies back to what it was in 1712, one penny. And it was a sort of a triumph. Uh, but Altic, again, <laughs> this guy doesn't know how much he's showing in this book, but he, he realizes there was a problem here, and it becomes a very interesting lesson uh, in how taxes work to the advantage of big business and against small business, and it's why we get the paradox of so many big businessmen actually supporting a tax system. Uh, and here's what Altic says on the subject. Uh, again, uh, very perceptive if he only knew uh, what the larger consequences are. The tax was lowered to a penny a sheet, but generous as the concession appeared on the surface, the new act was immediately recognized as a fresh obstacle in England's progress towards a cheap newspaper press. It was so framed and above all so enforced, that it became primarily a means of preserving the journalistic monopoly of the moneyed publishers. So far as the small publisher was concerned, the penny duty was as onerous as the four-penny one had been. That doesn't compute to me economically, but no one's going to accuse this guy of being an economist. But he does go on to make a valid point. His expenses in having his paper stamped, and the loss he sustained on unsold copies, whose stamps were not redeemable, virtually equaled the cost of the stamp itself. In addition, since the news vendor got a 25% discount on the total price of each paper, the publisher, in effect, had to pay a premium on the penny tax. Finally, and I think this is the important point, the increased stringency of the security provisions of the Newspaper Stamp Act, requiring heavy bonds to be posted against the printing of criminal libel, placed an impossible burden upon the resources of the small publisher. And there's the lesson to be learned from this episode. Uh, that the tax burden system is disproportionately burdensome on the small businessman. Uh, uh, big business can handle it, uh, but it really uh, uh, makes it difficult for the small businessman to operate. So here's a case with this apparent victory, the reduction of the tax uh, by a significant uh, uh, amount, uh, it was a quarter of what it was, still didn't have the effect of liberating uh, the, uh, 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 the free press uh, in England. Uh, so the real, the real tax revolt against these so-called knowledge taxes came uh, around 1850, and it was led by Richard Cobden. Richard Cobden, the great uh, force behind free trade, uh, my hero among British po politicians of the 19th century. You can have Disraeli, you can have uh, uh, even Gladstone. Richard Cobden uh, was the greatest uh, political force uh, in England, uh, along with his colleague John Bright. They were the men who founded the Anti-Corn Law League. They were the ones who finally, in the 1840s, managed to get the protectionist tariffs uh, on imported grain lifted uh, in, in England. Uh, they really, uh, Cobden and Bright invented single-issue politics, uh, they really uh, did more to create uh, uh, anti-big uh, government uh, forces uh, in politics than anyone in history. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, having won the great victory against the Corn Laws in England, against in favor of free trade, against protectionism, uh, Cobden was searching around for an issue, uh, and he decided these knowledge taxes uh, would be his next uh, goal. Not as significant an issue as free trade, uh, and frankly, he had to turn to it because it was, seemed to be the only victory uh, he could win. Uh, his opposition to the Crimean War, for example, uh, got him nowhere. That got him out of, <laughs> voted out of Parliament at one point later in the 1850s. Uh, but anyway, he did, uh, along with his, his great sidekick, John Bright, they led the fight in Parliament against these taxes. Uh, they held committee hearings. Uh, a lot of our evidence about 19th century reading patterns and the economics of the publishing industry come out uh, of those uh, 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 hearings uh, in Parliament. Uh, and uh, Coppin's public statements on it show uh, what the issue was uh, as, uh, as he saw it. Uh, it really was an issue of getting knowledge out to the people. Uh, uh, he said daily, daily papers in London, which at this point cost five pence. The price had come down a bit, but still not enough. And Cobden said, who below the rank of a merchant or wholesale dealer can afford to take in a daily paper at five pence? Clearly, it is beyond the reach of the mechanic uh, and the shopkeeper. So the goal here behind this uh, agitation in Parliament uh, was to get these taxes removed specifically so that the common man and woman in England would have access uh, to newspapers. The debate uh, uh, in Parliament is very instructive. Uh, Gladstone was at this point uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, uh, who's responsible for preparing the British budget. Uh, and he actually was in favor of repealing these taxes uh, and uh, threw his weight behind it. Uh, <laughs> For one reason or another, he then removed his chancellor of the Exchequer, and a successor, a man named George Cornwall Lewis, um, made this statement in the course of the parliamentary debate. And I think it's very telling. Uh, he said uh, uh, that he had heard from many quarters that this measure, quote, will open the floodgates of sedition and blasphemy and will inundate the country with licentious and immoral productions will undermine the very foundations of society and scatter the seeds of revolution broadcast over land. Newspapers. The people have access to newspapers. Uh, all hell will break loose in the country. Uh, and again, this was basically the ideology that had uh, uh, supported uh, these taxes up to this point. Uh, significantly, at this point, the London Times turned against the taxes. The Times, which in many ways was the benefit of this tax system, according to that argument, that it was a large operation. It could handle uh, the, the tax uh, code, the tax system, whereas upstart newspapers uh, uh, couldn't. But in a spirit of genuine public spiritedness, uh, the Times editorial uh, did say uh, about this tax, it's a tax on knowledge, a tax on light, a tax on education, a tax on truth, a tax on public opinion, a tax on good order and good government, a tax on society, a tax on the progress of human affairs and on the working of human institutions. Uh, and so clearly the, the tide of opinion had turned uh, against these uh, taxes. Uh, and uh, 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 I think it's 1855 uh, that the stamp tax on newspaper was removed. The postal stamp still continued. Uh, uh, and finally, in 1861, uh, the, the duty uh, on paper was repealed. Uh, and guess what? <laughs> the results predicted by Cobden and his party turned out to be exactly right. Uh, very soon after the taxes were dropped, the price of newspapers in London dropped to one penny. From five pennies to one penny. It does seem to indicate that a very large proportion of the cost of the paper was directly attributed to these various taxes on paper and stamp taxes, so on. Uh, uh, and uh, guess what? Price now at a penny instead of five pe pe pennies, their circulation uh, just started to escalate. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, you start to get papers circulating in the hundreds of thousands finally after their price comes down to one penny. Moreover, uh, it's right at this point in the 1850s that the first provincial newspapers start up in England. Uh, up to this point, every newspaper was based in London. 
because that's the only place where it's economically uh, feasible. Uh, but, for example, by 1876 in Manchester, which, as some of you may know, was the center of the free trade movement, uh, there was a total of 125,000 uh, uh, circulation of the papers in the city of Manchester, whereas before these taxes were repealed, there were no papers at all in Manchester. Uh, so it's, it's clear uh, that this campaign against uh, the, the taxes was justified. Uh, uh, and that you can see that the, the explosion in print publications in England uh, really is tied directly uh, to this change in tax law that people like Cobden and Bright uh, uh, agitated for. So it's a, again, it's a marvelous lesson in how unprogressive taxation can be. And here you're at a case where, where literally the government was targeting the spread of knowledge as something that should be retarded precisely by the structure of the tax laws. Uh, now, let me turn to another subject that Altic brings up, uh, uh, and that's libraries. And you're going to get to hear an English professor argue against libraries. How often do you get to hear that? Uh, and indeed, it's an important case because, you know, we have been talking about the evils of taxation, uh, and our opponents would say, well, what about the benefits of taxation? I mean, you're just talking about it as a purely negative thing. Don't people get something in return for their tax money? Uh, so let me take the episode of public libraries in 19th century Britain uh, to illustrate this issue. Uh, and here, uh, Altic shows uh, his true colors, uh, and it's really amusing uh, in that sense uh, to see how he misconstrues uh, uh, his own subject and what he's discovered. Here he is, he's got a whole chapter on the development of, of public libraries as part of his story of the spreading of literacy in 19th century Britain. And, you know, the issue is whether tax money should be spent to build, build libraries. And what all, here's how he describes it. He's writing in the 1950s here. What seems to us in the perspective of, uh, 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 of a century, uh, a fairly simple question. Shall or shall not government provide the people with free reading facilities involved all sorts of peripheral, if not actually irrelevant, considerations. Now, I want you to hear what these peripheral even irrelevant considerations were. He says, you know, strange enough, people argued against public libraries in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, uh, they denounced it as a frightening new attempt of the state to encroach upon the liberties of the people. Dedicated as they were to the principle of voluntarism, they submitted that the provision of libraries, like that of education, was totally outside the proper sphere of government. On less theoretical grounds, they fought the bill because it would add the last straw to the load of the already groaning taxpayer. There it is. That is what is a peripheral or even irrelevant subject to an English professor. Uh, that the argument that this might raise people's taxes, that's incomprehensible to him. How could they have made uh, that argument? On the other hand, when he's talking about the proponents of the bill, uh, he says... Uh, although they offered no evidence of any popular demand for free libraries, they knew that once libraries were provided, they would be welcomed. <laughs> there it is. I mean, you know, his absolutely foregone conclusion, free libraries are the most wonderful thing in the world. Anyone who argues against it is crazy. Anyone who argues for it, even if they offer no evidence, must be right. Now, uh, uh, let's look in practice uh, uh, at this situation because it did involve uh, an issue of taxes. What this legislation enabled was this. Uh, it was all done on a local basis uh, that town councils, which then ran municipalities in, in England, uh, were allowed uh, uh, to pass a, a, a tax rate of one half penny on the pound uh, in order to erect libraries. Uh, uh, the opponents of the bill, who didn't manage to get defeated, did manage to get a rider... Uh, that it required a two-thirds vote of the taxpayers present at the meeting to authorize the tax. Very interesting. I wish we had more laws like this, that people had to vote, and two-thirds of them had to vote to impose the tax on them. Uh, and now, poor Mr. Altick, writing about this, is really surprised. Popular apathy was overwhelming. 
in town after town, proposals to adopt the acts were defeated. Not once, but repeatedly and by large margins. As late as 1896, only 334 districts, many of them small, had levered the library rate. In 1887, only two parishes in all of metropolitan London had tax-supported libraries. Uh, uh, And then he says, even more surprised, you know, we didn't get libraries in England until Andrew Carnegie came along and gave the money for them. And then he adds, a vindication perhaps uh, of that preference for the voluntary principle. Again, he just, he just doesn't get a clue. It just doesn't get through to him what story he's actually telling here. Uh, but it's actually very interesting to see uh, what happened here, that when people were given the choice of imposing the tax on themselves for this wonderful purpose of erecting free libraries, they voted overwhelmingly against it uh, throughout England. Uh, uh, now, what's even more important, though, is to look at what happened in the actual libraries that were built. Uh, because the argument behind them was based on education. Uh, that is, uh, the, uh, uh, the notion was public money should be spent on this because public libraries uh, will contribute to the education of the public and we need a more educated public. And what could be better for that than libraries? Well, what ended up in the libraries? Fiction. Best-selling fiction. Uh, Wherever free libraries were open, the volume of patronage bore a direct relationship to the amount of fiction available. At Sheffield in the period 1856 to 67, prose fiction accounted for almost half of the combined circulation of the consulting and lending departments. Uh, By the 1890s, most free libraries reported that between 65% and 90% of the books circulated were classified as fiction. So there it is. You establish a library, supposedly so the populace will have access to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and they're showing up to read the cheapest popular bestsellers that they can, that they can. And you know this is true today. Uh, Libraries are held up as this great public institution increasingly, the main thing they lend is videotapes and DVDs. And these libraries that are supposed to be the great repositories and defenders of books in our world, they're really feeding television viewing in that effect. Now, I mean, I, uh, no one likes television more than I do. Uh, but the question is why uh, you should be publicly funding activities that are just private enjoyment. And indeed, it's fascinating to see uh, that these arguments were weighed way back in Victorian Britain. There's almost nothing new in the world. The problem of view was summarized in the publisher's circular in 1877. This is what they wrote. Free libraries, which should only be provided for the poor and helpless, not for those who can help themselves, should be resorted to for education and instruction and should begin at elementary works long antecedent to works of imaginative fiction. If the taxpayers are to provide imaginative fiction or the luxuries of the mind for slightly poorer classes, why should they not also provide free games, free plays, bread and circuses, free cakes and nuts for the boys? Which I believe a number of libraries do now. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, another person reported uh, when he went to a library, uh, libraries in his district, I have found as a rule every chair occupied, and by whom? In nine cases out of ten, by loafing office boys or clerks who were using their master's time for devouring all the most trivial literary trash they could find. Many are the crimes brought about by the disordered imagination of a reader of sensational and often immoral rubbish. And another one of the commentators in the Victorian period had the goal, the nerve, according to Alter, to call this socialism, these libraries. Uh, uh, let me see, that's on, uh, yeah, 320. Uh, 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 is a disciple of, uh, uh, of uh, Herbert Spencer, writing in a volume edited by Spencer, uh, a scorching attack on the free library as the socialist finishing school. <laughs> Uh, uh, free libraries are perfect godsends to the town loafer who finds himself housed and amused at the public expense and may lounge away his time among the intellectual luxuries which his neighbors are taxed to provide for him. The truth is that a free library favors one special section of the community, the book readers, at the expense of all the rest. If one man may have his hobby paid for by his neighbors, why not all? 
This mendacious appeal to the numerical majority to force a demoralizing and pauperizing institution upon the minority is an attempt to revive in municipal legislation a form of coercion we have outgrown in religious matters. Uh, uh, now, Alter quotes these things as if, you know, these are the craziest opinions in the world. But here it is, a really astute analysis of what the real meaning of public libraries is. It's taxing everybody to pay for the enjoyments uh, of some people. Uh, and then Altic himself has to recognize there was something odd about uh, their library, these libraries. Even though he supports them uh, as a 20th century liberal, he does say, from the outset, library buildings were the chosen haunts of public building parasites. Vagrants taking shelter from rain and cold. Doesn't this sound familiar? Loafers and eccentrics. Listen to this now. This is Altic himself speaking. Because they received the latest papers, libraries were the resort of the unemployed who flocked to inspect the advertisements of situations vacant. And I love this. Of racing enthusiasts who not only made their daily selections from the papers, but conducted financial <laughs> transactions on the premises. The Victorian Library is boogie joint. To frustrate these shabby turfmen, some libraries obliterated the racing news from each paper as it arrived. And now, going on with the tragedy of the commons here, and Altic is so surprised by this, what with the unsavory odor of the ill-ventilated rooms, the presence of dirty, snoring loafers, and the assembling on the steps uh, of loafers spitting, smoking, and discussing the merits and demerits of horses and language unfit for quotation. It was no wonder that many women shrank from approaching free libraries, however eager they were for books. Most self-respecting libraries had to set aside separate ladies' rooms or at least screened off a part of their reading room for the exclusive use of females and some installed ladies' entrances. Uh, so there's a perfect example of you know, something that sounds so high-minded, high-sounding, uh, uh, free libraries for the public. We just have to tax a bit to do it. Again, where people were given the choice, they refused to do it, and even where it was instituted, it had very much the different effects uh, 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 than the government uh, intended. So, you know, these benefits you supposedly uh, get from the tax money you send to the government are dubious at best and usually quite contrary to your interests. But who killed John Keats? I, you know, I've been teasing you with that all along. Uh, and I have to, John Keats died of tuberculosis. <laughs> He died of natural causes, and I really, uh, I can blame a lot of things on the English tax system, and I hope I have here, but I really, I can't, I can't blame them for the death of Keats. Yet, there's some suspicion here. As some of you may know, uh, the, uh, the great story about Keats is that he was killed by the bad reviews uh, of uh, his poem Endymion. Uh, uh, they were extremely hostile. Uh, they, they hurt him very much. Uh, and the legend spread that this broke his heart. Uh, and they didn't know too much about tuberculosis in those days, so the legend spread uh, that Keats had been killed by his bad reviews. This is expressed, for example, by Lord Byron. There's a great satiric poem, Don Juan, in the 11th canto, stands uh, uh, 60. Uh, I'm not the only one to try to get humor out of this awful subject. Uh, John Keats, who was killed off by one critique, just as he really promised something great, if not intelligible, without Greek, contrived to talk about the gods of late, much as they might have been supposed to speak. Poor fellow, his was an untoward fate. Tis strange, the mind, that very fiery particle, should let itself be snuffed out by an article. Uh, but there it is. There is enshrined in Byron's poetry the idea that Keats was killed uh, by the bad reviews of Endymion. Just so you understand how bad the reviews were, I do want to read you uh, some excerpts from them uh, to give you a sense of how vicious reviews could be in the 18th century. This is one from Blackwood's Magazine by John Gibson uh, Lockhart. Uh, uh, he's talking about John Keats. You know, maybe the greatest poet of the 19th century and his first major poem, Endymion. To witness the disease of any human understanding, however feeble, is distressing. But the spectacle of an able mind reduced to a state of insanity is, of course, ten times more afflicting. It is with such sorrow as this that we have, been, we have contemplated the case of Mr. John Keats. Uh, 
This young man appears to have received from nature talents of an excellent, perhaps even of a superior order, talents which devoted to the purposes of any useful profession uh, must have rendered him a respectable, if not an eminent, uh, citizen. His friends, we understand, destined him to the career of medicine. And he was bound to apprentice some years ago to a worthy apothecary in town. But all has been undone by a sudden attack of the malady to which we have alluded. Uh, and then he goes on and talks about how crazy the poem is. And he ends by saying, We venture to make one small prophecy that his bookseller will not a second time venture 50 pounds upon anything he can write. It is a better and a wiser thing to be a starved apothecary than a starved poet. Uh, but for heaven's sake, young Keats, be a little more sparing of soporifics in your drugs than you have been in your poetry. Ooh, I mean, that would have killed me. Uh, and just one other review uh, by John, John Wilson Croker in the Quarterly Review. This, I wish more reviewers would be open about this, but this is the opening of the review. Reviewers have been sometimes accused of not reading the works which they affected to criticize. On the present occasion, we should anticipate the author's complaint and honestly confess that we have not read his work. <laughs> Would that John Maynard Keynes had said that about Mises' uh, theory of money and credit and been open about it. Uh, not that we have been wanting in our duty, far from it. Indeed, we have made efforts almost as superhuman as the story itself appears to be to get through it. But with the fullest stretch of our perseverance, we are forced to confess that we have not been able to struggle beyond the first of the four books of which this poetic romance consists. We should extremely lament this want of energy or whatever it may be in our parts, were it not for one consolation, namely, that we are no better acquainted with the meaning of the book through which we have so painfully toiled than we are with that of the three which we have not looked into. <laughs> Now, again, it really does not get more vicious than that, and I'm sure it would have killed me. It, it probably is not really what killed Keats. Upon his autopsy, they found his lungs were, in fact, entirely uh, dead. But if this were true, if the reviews did kill John Keats, uh, then the Inland Revenue Board in England was responsible. By the way, notice the great difference between Britain and America. Uh, they have an inland revenue board. We have an internal revenue uh, uh, service. Notice, you know, what that revolution was about. You know, we did so much so that we wouldn't have an, in, an inland revenue board, but could rather have an internal uh, revenue service. And it's actually very interesting. I, I, I was thinking of this throughout Tom DeLorenzo's talk last night, but uh, the British tried to in, uh, introduce an income tax in 1815, right at the end of the Napoleonic War, supposedly pay off the debt of the Napoleonic Wars. The major objection in Britain that actually defeated the bill was a privacy issue. Guess what? The British were saying, well, what's the government going to have to know about us in order to enforce this income tax? And in fact, whose business is it of anybody to know what our income is? Uh, so it's very, I mean, how prophetic the English public was at the time. But the Inland Revenue Board uh, came into existence. And now to go back quickly to that advertisement tax. Uh, I didn't talk much about that, but it was part of this system of knowledge taxes. Uh, it tax, taxed every single uh, advertisement. As we've been seeing in many cases, uh, people are resilient. They will get around taxes any way they can. Uh, and so uh, when advertisers were being taxed, the British publishing industry invented the puff piece. Uh, our whole current uh, system of uh, literary publicity really grows out of this era. Uh, to run an ad for a book, you are going to be taxed for it. So uh, you can save money by just paying off the reviewer, getting him to write a favorable review, uh, which did as good a job and cost less than paying the tax in most cases. Uh, so uh, for a while, the English press uh, was churning out an awful lot of positive reviews. The government got suspicious of this and started to tax Positive reviews as advertisements. Uh, it was at that point that the English reviewing press turned vicious. Now, the English have these vicious impulses all along, but, but it is interesting that it does seem that the unusually vicious tone of reviewing in the 1820s uh, had something to do with this advertisement tax uh, situation. And so I can't prove it. Uh, 
But if those reviews are what really killed John Keats, the nastiness of the reviews may be an artifact of the British tax system, uh, in which case uh, it killed John Keats. <laughs> I'll stop there.